So many Christians love to quote Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, which says, For I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And this is one of our favorite Bible verses because it just makes us feel so good. But should we as Christians be quoting this verse? What does this verse even mean in its original context? And should we just jump and apply it to our own lives? In this video, you're not gonna wanna miss, I'm gonna talk about what that verse actually means so that if you do choose to quote it, you'll be quoting it with the right perspective. That is coming up today on The Beat. Hey my friend, welcome back to The Beat. My name is Alan Parr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, it's a pleasure. If you want a free ebook, click the link in the description box below. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing. Hit that little bell notification so you won't miss a beat. Okay, so I don't normally say this, guys, but I want to encourage you to watch this entire video. If you are tempted to turn off on it at some point, please don't do that. Watch it all the, all the way to the end because I'm going to show you exactly what the context is for this verse and how we can best understand it so that if we choose to quote this over our lives, we at least know what it means. And so let's first and foremost look at the context of Jeremiah 29, 11, which once again says, for I know the plan plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Well, in order to understand Jeremiah chapter 29, it is important for us to understand the context of the book of Jeremiah to begin with. So let's go back and let's do a little bit of an overview of Old Testament history. So first and foremost, you have the nation of Israel and they move into the promised land. And this land was previously inhabited by all sorts of pagan nations like the Jebusites and the Hivites and the Canaanites and all these different other pagan, ungodly, evil nations. And it was God's intent that the nation of Israel would be a light and they would permeate the culture with God's goodness and God's righteousness and God's um, standards and norms and all of these things. But sadly, the nation of Israel failed on that mission and instead of conforming that culture around them, they conformed to the culture and they became quickly contaminated by the evil nations around them and so their light was extinguished. But because God loved them so much, God did not just punish them and destroy them right away. No, he warned them over the period of hundreds of years by sending prophets like Isaiah and Micah and Hosea and all these different people, but they rejected their message. They didn't want to listen to all these people. So eventually over time, God said, you know what? I'm going to get their attention and I am going to punish my children by allowing a a foreign wicked nation called Babylon to enter into Jerusalem, to enter into the promised land, to kidnap them, to destroy that land and take them back over to Babylon. And so Jeremiah is one of those prophets who God has sent to speak to the people of Israel while they have been taken away from their land in captivity. So once again, the context for Jeremiah chapter 29 is that God has punished his people. They are depressed. They are discouraged. They're losing hope. They don't believe that God has a plan for them anymore, and they are no longer living in the promised land. So now that we see the context for the book of Jeremiah, let's now go look at the content of Jeremiah chapter 29. The first thing that we see in this passage of scripture is basically that God is telling them, you guys need to get comfortable right where you are because it, you're going to be there for a very long time. Let's read what it says. It says in verse five, build homes and plan to stay, plant gardens and eat the food they produce, marry and have children. Then find spouses for your children so that you may have many grandchildren. So basically God is saying, 
uh, you're not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. So you might as well just stretch out. You might as well just settle down. You might as well just get comfortable because don't think that this is going to be a quick little time that you're over here in Babylon and you're just going to come right back to their homeland. No, no, no. You're going to be there for a while. So get comfortable. So think about it. Whenever you and I anticipate being able to um, uh, leave somewhere, we don't normally send our kids to brand new schools. We don't normally start new relationships. We don't normally start a business. We don't normally build a new home when we're getting ready to leave. But God is basically saying, you need to do all those things because you're gonna be there for 70 years. Now, I'm sure that this was the exact opposite that the nation of Israel wanted to hear, particularly if you were of the older generation, because that basically means that if there's 70 years that we're gonna be in Babylon, that means that I may not ever return back to my homeland. And so once again, we're starting to see the context of this verse is that it's a pretty bad situation and it's gonna to continue to be bad before it actually gets better. But the second thing that we see that God tells them to do is not only to get comfortable, but to actually help their oppressor. Notice what it says here. It says, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. You see, Whenever you and I are in a bad situation, the very last thing that we feel like doing is praying for the very person or the people that were responsible for getting us into that situation. But God is saying, look, since you're gonna be there for 70 years, you might as well make the best of it. You might as well pray for the people around you and pray for the city that you are living in because as that city prospers, even if you don't like the people in that city, you are gonna prosper as well. And since you ain't going anywhere, for 70 years, that is probably a good thing for you to do. But the third thing that God tells them in this passage, remember, we haven't even gotten to verse 11, the one we always love to quote, is this, to reject prosperity preaching. Now, if you think that prosperity preaching just started in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or whatever, then my friend, you are sadly mistaken because this idea of prosperity preaching and theology it actually extended way back into the Old Testament. So now watch this now. Before we even get to Jeremiah chapter 29, it's helpful for us to jump back a chapter and actually look at the context in Jeremiah chapter 28. And what you will see is that there was a false prophet by the name of Hananiah. And this guy named Hananiah was basically prophesying that they were only going to be removed from their land for two years. Yes two years and God is like, nah, that's wrong. That's a false prophecy. Come on back. Let's actually take a look at it. Notice it says here in Jeremiah 28, Hananiah, once again, a false prophet, son of Azor, a prophet from Gibeon, addressed me publicly in the temple while all the priests and people listened. He said, now notice he's going to start to say, this is what the Lord says. And this is exactly what false prophets in our day are actually doing the same thing. They're claiming that they're hearing from God, but they're really not. It says here, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says, I will remove the yoke of the king of Babylon from your necks. No, God didn't say that. God said, you're going to be there for 70 years. All right, but let's see what it says. Within two years, I will bring back all the temple treasures that King Nebuchadnezzar carried off to Babylon, and I will bring back Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other captives that were taken to Babylon. I will surely break the yoke that the king of Babylon has put on your necks. I, the Lord, have spoken. You see, he's saying, hey, you're only going to be over there for two years because God's going to bless you. God's going to bring you back. God's going to bring the king back. God's going to break the yoke of the Babylonians. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what God is actually saying. Now let's go back to chapter 29 and it says this, God is saying, do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. You see, 
This is the reason why we got to be careful who we listen to and who we place ourselves under because there's so many people out there that are going to tell you your blessing is on the way. God has a miracle in your life. God's going to break this yoke in your life. God's going to deliver you. God's going to bless you. No, 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 no. It very well may be that you may be unemployed for another year or two. It very well may be that your spouse may continue to cheat on you or that your child may not come back or that the person that is sick very well may not get healed. But we don't want to hear those things. They didn't want to hear those things. So what do we do? We surround ourselves with people that are going to tell us what our itching ears want to hear. And that's exactly what was happening here in the Old Testament. So God is essentially saying, hey, I didn't tell them that you're going to be there for two years. No, no, no. I am in the midst of punishing you for your bad behavior, for your disobedience. You know, oftentimes we are ourselves, we ourselves are getting ourselves into situations and then we expect God to just deliver us. Listen, I've got news for you. You can't believe your way out of something you behaved your way into. Let me repeat that. You can't believe your way out of something that you behaved your way into. If you're in a situation because of your disobedience, it doesn't matter what somebody prophesies over your life. It very well may be that God is disciplining you in the season that you are in. Now, this isn't the first time in the book of Jeremiah that God warns his people to turn away from false prophets. Now, don't worry, we're getting back to the uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 in just a second. But notice it says here in chapter 23 of Jeremiah, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says to his people. Do not listen to these prophets when they prophesy to you. Notice filling you with futile hopes. They are making up everything they say. They do not speak for the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise my word, don't worry. The Lord says you will have peace. See, he's, they're basically saying you can live any way that you want to, but God doesn't care. God's still going to have peace in your life. And God says, no, no, no. You can't just disobey me and expect everything to work out well. He says, those are false prophets. And then he says, and to those who stubbornly follow their own desires, they say, no harm will come your way. Have any of these prophets been in the Lord's presence to hear what he is really saying? Has even one of them cared enough to listen? So now with all of that context, now let's read Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 in its context. For God says, for I know the plans that I have for you. Now, what are those plans? The plans are that you're going to be struggling for 70 years. Things are going to be bad. Things are not going to work out. You're going to be uncomfortable for 70 years, right? But eventually God says, I am going to bring you back into the promised land. And then you will call upon me and I will hear you. And then we'll be together again and, 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 and we'll experience this spiritual intimacy again. But the initial plans that I have for you is that things are going to be very bad for you before they actually get better. And so listen, should we as believers quote this passage of scripture? Well, yes, if we understand what it means, which means, hey, God, if I say, well, I know the plans that you have for me, that means that I'm accepting that it may not be my plans. It may not always be something positive. It may not always be that everything is going to work out right when I want it to or exactly how I want it to. It very well may be, God, that if I quote that verse, I have to be ready for God to say, you know what? My plans may be that you're single for another five years. My plans may be that you're not going to have children for another five years. My plans may be that you may still continue to struggle financially for a season because maybe I'm teaching you something in that particular particular season. So should we quote that verse? Absolutely. Should we quote it without understanding the context? Absolutely not. When you and I understand the context of the verses that we are quoting, it will oftentimes unlock the true meaning behind that verse so that we can fully understand what it means and how it applies to our life. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time on The Beat.